all that is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This low Sunday of Easter, we have a remarkable lesson that is given today to Thomas and to all of us baptized Catholics. Anyone who serves God and works out his salvation must, and I repeat, must learn this lesson that our good Jesus is trying to teach. It's a vital lesson, especially in this day of age when the holy faith is undermined in millions of ways. And this lesson is this. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The Dom Prosper Guaranger has a great analysis and comments on St. Thomas that can do us a great deal of good for our own faith. Here are some questions about the um, dilemma of St. Thomas of today, the doubting Thomas. Did not Jesus hear Thomas just now, who makes a profession that at least now he firmly believes? And he exclaims those words, my Lord and my God, wouldn't that suffice to kind of pad in the punch when our Lord didn't di direct the word. Was there any great fault in Thomas's insisting on having evidence before believing in an extraordinary miracle such as the resurrection? Was Thomas obliged to trust in the testimony of Peter and the others? under the pain of offending the divine master? Didn't Thomas instead evince prudence rather on the side of caution? Would it seem wildly immoral to withhold his assent until he had additional proofs? Thomas, get this, Thomas was indeed a circumspect and prudent man, according to the Aristotelian ethics of the moral code of humanity. So what's up with all of this? Where did he go wrong? What's going on? But here's the problem with Thomas and also every baptized Catholic, the bar is much higher than just the mere human and the mere natural. Because having dwelt intimately with Jesus by vocation and divine grace, he was expected to have a faith on the third day after our Lord's death. Say, so, hmm, well, if we're not directed by the Holy Ghost, but here's the question. It's Luke chapter 12, verse 48, from the very words of our Lord. He says, and unto whomsoever much is given of him much, will be required. And our Lord gave grace upon grace to that great apostle, St. Thomas. And so under normal circumstances, we would applaud Thomas's demeanor 
as wise and almost lawyer-like, virtuous, yet listen to the reproach given him uh, by Jesus. Jesus' mercy here is most severe for Thomas to bear. Christ our Lord punishes Thomas, not with violence, not with withdrawing himself, not even imposing some fast or otherwise other things, rather by riveting his heart with every syllable of these words, Thomas, thou hast believed because thou hast seen. Can you imagine the tremendous disappointment caused within the heart of St. Thomas hearing those words that were spoken with such gentleness and also with such disappointment, almost like an inside joke, an inside reality among the two of them. Just seeing that face was enough to prefer to go fasting 40 days with just bread and water than to see that face so overcome with grief. So yes, the bar was set high with the standards of merely the natural realm. Thomas would have been considered a hero of good reason and sound judgment. But the apostles, get this, were duty-bound to believe in the resurrection of Jesus even before he showed himself to them. You say, well, okay, well, let's get to the bottom of this. Why is that so? Well, because they lived with him three years. They saw his remarkable miracles. Bread was multiplied, lepers were made clean, the blind saw, the lame walked, the mute spoke. There was no need for hospitals wherever our Lord was going. He was the hospital himself at any given drop of the hat. And they saw this with their two eyeballs. The possessed were freed from the diabolical. The depressed were cheered with celestial joy. The dead was raised to life. Think of this, the son of the widow of Naim or Lazarus or the daughter of Jarius and others. Thomas saw those in many more cor- cases time and time again. And here's the key punch right here. Thomas and the others were forewarned, backing up with all these miracles, but forewarned them with his divine word that he would suffer and be tortured and to be put to death. And he told them that he would rise again on the third day. And therefore, they all should have believed once they heard that the body had disappeared, as the only one did, St. John the Evangelist. What St. John did was honest. It was an honest approach. But the hesitancies and the tardiness makes God take further advances so that the disciple can give his faith and his allegiance. My dear sisters and dear guests of the sisters, we have to learn this crucial lesson of the the faith, even though we live in a post-faith society where everything is just measured by empirical data, rationalism, subjectivism, sentimentalism, just what pleases me. 
And, and it's so important to recuperate the sense of the holy faith. It's so, so powerfully important that even St. John in his epistle today, the first epistle, chapter 5, says that this is the victory, the overcoming of the world, our faith. Not in a recount of votes of some politician or whatever. It is the holy faith, the medieval faith, that we're willing to die for Christ our Lord, this will conquer the world. Do you know that there were thousands of miracles of the Holy Eucharist in medieval Europe? Why is that? Hundreds of these cases because there was holy faith. Now, not everybody was a walking angel, believe me, far from it. But People had the faith. And this faith needs to be recuperated. Even though we're the Lone Rangers, we have to recuperate this faith. And the sisters understand the value of this faith. And that's why they have separated themselves from the world. This is why they have taken on the habit. And believe it or not, I might surprise you here, but maybe some sister may be going through 20 years of dryness, not one single consolation in prayer, and there she is still with a smile, uh, sweeping the floor day in and day out. But they're all here because of some experience of that holy faith once that was enough to convince them to give themselves to Christ with all confidence and even for the rest of their lives. And the faith of those sisters and the faith of those monks has created counter-reformations within Christendom of great importance throughout the centuries. Now, following Christ, the Son of the living God, the incarnate Word of God, it is only worthy to demand total and integral adherence to the truth that had been told by truth itself. And this is why what we profess during the week I'm sorry, what we profess during the Sunday in our creed, we have to live throughout the week. If we profess in the creed on Sunday that we believe in the Lord, we believe in His resurrection, we believe in life everlasting, or we believe in remission of sins, but then commit mortal sins on Wednesday and Friday afternoon, nulls your faith. Now, Human weakness will bring you to confessional and so forth. But if this is a pattern, if it's unbroken, then you have denied the holy faith. The words of St. John, chapter 10, verse 26, 28, will give us great confidence so we can make that act of faith, a faith that dictates the rest of our Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Our Lord Jesus says, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them life everlasting, and they shall not perish forever. And no man shall pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 26 to 28. So therefore, let us learn this lesson of faith. Let us also rejoice in this faith. It's not just something that encumbers us like a straitjacket, 
but rather frees us. We become free people of the children of God. And therefore, this faith is more precious than silver and gold, St. Peter says. And I conclude with these words from the great St. Gregory the Great, one of the greatest popes that ever lived in Christendom. He says, Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Brethren refers to us. For we have not seen him in the flesh. There might be one of you here that might have seen the Sacred Heart. I don't know. It's very rare. But at least St. Gregory says, we haven't seen him. We didn't have these visions and apparitions. We haven't seen him in the flesh, but we know him in the mind. So, if we put our faith to the proof by good works, we are blessed. And he who gives expression to his faith, listen to this, is a genuine believer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.